Moin Moin and hello ladies and gentlemen, Don Spector here today with another review and I have for you today the Jan Yin or Jan Jean Cannon and $350 or after importing in the EU at like $450, $420 depending on where you live so uh, yeah and relatively medium high priced IEM and as we already can see here belongs to the audio file. Well, yeah, so um, yeah, well, general information, I think more, you can see at the back here, uh, it's a hybrid, it has, I think, four BAs and one biocellulose, biological diaphragm, they say, biocellulose dynamic driver, I think it has 10 millimeters, and from what I have read in the comments under my unboxing, it's not the same uh, that has been utilized in the other Yanin, in the uh, Ala Aladin, Aladin? Uh, so yeah, this one is, uh, from least from the comments that I read, a different one. And yeah, it, this has gotten at least a bit of praise from the people who used it. And if you look at the storefront on AliExpress, for instance, you do see people saying, oh, this is end game in quotes. Yeah, great. Uh, hmm. Not so sure about that. And I would say in the course of this review, we figure out if the Yan Yin Canon actually is end game. And as usual, I'll be starting off with packaging, accessories and the current unboxing. That's the box, just plain black, and you can remove the... Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, very tight sitting cardboard around here. A bit of a bit wasteful, but at least it looks nice. And then we get to a plain, plain black box. And if we manage to shake it loose, well, because the tolerance is here again, very, very tight. Yeah. Come on. Uh. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is just me struggling with packaging. Ah, yeah, tolerance is very tight. Uh, similar to the uh, Triple Win Olina, which I unboxed the last time. This is just tight tolerances, not easy to remove. But uh, if you don't wear gloves, I think it's a bit easier. Yes, then uh, here in this pouch would be the carrying case, which I already have removed. We come to that later on. Then we have another small pouch here, which basically contains, I think, Warranty card and additional information and stuff. Yeah, so also the control number. Yeah, very nice. And beneath that, when we have the tips. And that's pretty much it. Like, you don't get much more in the packaging. And that already brings me to the first point of critique here. Packaging accessories. Why this one is definitely, like, it looks nice. It, presentation is decent. What's with these tips? Like... What the hell, like this is just random ass silicon tips that don't really do anything special. And you even only get one pair of each sort. We don't even get foam tips. We don't get any special tips. We don't get like some nice tips. It's just random ass silicon tips for $350 or 420 euros. It's just, eh, I don't know. It's not enough in my opinion. Yeah, and then we come to the carrying box. Let me just remove that here. So that's out of the way. This is the carrying case it would come with. It's definitely what I would call a chunky boy. Um, I did measure it. Uh, yeah, it's nine centimeters wide. It's um, almost seven deep, which means like this orientation and then five centimeters in girth or thickness. So it's really a chunky case. And the nice thing that is, well, it doesn't have any flex. Like this is really, it's a very solid casing. And when you remove it off the packaging, it does smell like real leather. I'm not sure if it is real leather, because if it is real leather, it doesn't feel too great, but it could be. And again, it can also be just perfume to smell like real leather. I don't know. I just want to tell you it smelled like real leather and it feels reasonably well made in the hand. Main problem is again, like the stitching here is fake. This is actually all glued. The bottom as well, it's glued, it's not stitched. So it just is for decoration, the stitching here. And uh, if you open it, then you get uh, real the inside which again is magnetically closed. And the first small problem is, you can see the IM with its thick cable, like just tapping it close doesn't stay. You really have to try to tuck it in here correctly, squeeze it a bit and then it will stay sharp because it has a magnet here. So I don't like that about the carrying case. I think they just should have chosen a better shape to fit with the IM. Uh, but generally the carrying case is well made. So yeah, we have this net here. It is relatively tight. You can squeeze additional tips beneath here if you would be getting some of the IEM. So you need to get your additional tips. And then if I remove it, you can see this is like this like rough lever on the inside. 
definitely looks and feels yeah like quality. Um, this is uh, caused by my foam tips. I'm sorry, this would not be the case for your normal carrying case. It just would be like plain normal, like we leather brown color. Um, yeah, uh, this is all, however, all glued in. Like nothing here is stitched. It, everything is glued. So there's the <laughs> room for improvement, I would say. And uh, yeah, generally, I think this is a well-made carrying case for the price, at least. I don't have much complaints. I just think it's not enough accessories. Like I want at least like two more pair of tips. Like at least put a pair of foam in here. I mean, maybe even a pair of like a uh, thicker uh, outlet or thicker like outlet uh, tips or something that is a bit more special than just random ass silicon tips that don't do anything. Like that's not enough for me. This is like basically on the realm of 40 to 50 dollar I am. So I really don't like that. However, what there maybe is to like is the IEM build and which I'll be talking next. So let me just remove a two pin connector so we can look at the IEM and I remove the tip. So yes, let's look at the IEM here. And I think this one might be even easier with old gloves. I wanted to try if, I, uh, uh, if gloves would make it better, but I think the contrast with already dark contoured IEM is not that great. So uh, I think I'll continue just with my bare hands. So yes. This is the bad boy, the Yan Yin Cannon. It has the symbol for Yan Yin. It looks like an R and D to me. Oh, I don't know, like, uh, it's, it's a symbol of Yan Yin. Let's not think about it too much. Yeah, uh, it utilizes raisin as most other semi-custom shell IEMs. And I'm not sure how well it's visible on the camera, but it has this like sparkly contours inside. That definitely does look pretty neat. And the uh, yeah, silver logo also generally works in terms of aesthetics for this one. Um, however, as already in slight note I have to give you, it is pretty light IEM. It really doesn't feel like it's like that quality. Um, the uh, variations, in which I will reference quite a few times in this review, just feels way better made because it just has solid raisin. The faceplate is very well integrated. It just feels better than this one. Like if you call me, like if you would compare it to variations directly, like variations is definitely a step up in terms of build from this. But other than that, it's it's a decently made IEM. You can see that the raisin is has a slight mismatch here in the terms of coloring for the two pin connector, which is like yellow tinted, like yellow hued compared to the uh, yeah like sparkly like black dark red raisin here so uh yeah like but at least they did uh, go out of the way and smoothed it nicely you can see it here like it is like one piece or almost one piece so that is nice and also the nozzle integration here has been done pretty well don't have much complaints about that a bit unique about the IEM build is that the nozzle has its lip like recessed by a few millimeters here. So maybe this can give you problems later on with tips. I didn't have any, but maybe if you have some special tips, could lead to problems. Uh, yeah, just want to uh, mention it. And then we have the uh, front mesh here, which is reasonably fine and feels uh, like it's well put into place. So unlike some KZ stuff where I already were like, whoo, hope this stays in place. I don't have this feeling here. So uh, yeah. Then the last uh, thing that we can see here is the dip switches. So yeah, we have on and uh, on is uh, on top, which also uh, thankfully they give you indication here. Other IEMs that I had with dip switches, they usually don't say you what the dip switch does or where on and off is. You're just supposed to know where things are. Here, fortunately, they tell you where the on and off is. And uh, yeah, I'm using it in the configuration. Uh, basically, for, uh, one and three are off and only two is on. I will be talking more about why later on when we talk about sound. And yeah, this is also just glued in like reasonably. Like you can see there's the glue around the edges here. Like it's it's okay. I've seen better dip switch implementations and I've seen worse dip switch implementations. So I would have liked to see a bit better one at this price point, but generally it's still okay. Like it doesn't feel like it's going to fall out at any time. And again, as with dip switches, normal, you do need a tool to actually switch them because with the thumbnail, for instance, I can't reach them. But fortunately, it is included here. I don't have it here at the moment, but it's basically one of those standard SIM card tray opener things which you can get with every smartphone or probably for a few cent online. So yeah, even if you lose it, not a big deal, just order a new one. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, there's a nice small attention to detail, uh, which I want to point out here. The pressure holes at the back here, they are red and blue, uh, like covered on the side. 
So that makes it easy to identify uh, left and right without uh, searching for the almost not visible L and R here, but uh, that's when we talk about cable. So yes, that's a nice small attention to detail, which I did like. Uh, same goes for the pressure hole itself, because that's pretty big. It's like two millimeters in diameter or something. And yeah, you definitely should apply a dust cover, which they did here. I don't see any other pressure hole around the IEM. Um, yeah, so there's only this one. And uh, yeah, when we talk about comfort later on, I have a comment about that. But generally, I don't have too much to complain here. The nozzle is just reintegrated. It feels a bit like it's probably aluminium, but it feels all right. So generally, yeah, not much to complain, but I think it's just not exactly on the price point. I would have expected a bit more in terms of how well the dip switches are integrated and uh, maybe also the two pin connector here, just give it at least matching color. The variations, for instance, at least manage to match something there. But generally, yeah, not much to complain. It's it's a semi custom shell I am without much to yeah without much like mm, special things. And then next chapter before we come to the comfort, let's talk about the cable. So I will be also removing the other I am so we can purely focus on the cable now. And what should I say? Yen Yin did a really good job with this cable. I really like the way how it handles. You basically just go one time like this and it is relatively straight. It just, yeah, you can show you like it is a bit curled, but really for a cable of this thickness, because this is a thick ass cable. Like really, it, it feels like nice to be had. It has good amount of weight without being as heavy as for instance, the fearless audio cable, because that is just, it's so chunky. It's just, it's heavy, all right? This one manages and uh, like strikes a nice balance between still being smooth enough, being thick and feeling nice and valuable, but still being like smooth in overall usage. And it comes with this like thick four cores that are like braided or like not braided, but uh, like woven relatively evenly over the whole length of the cable. And yeah, uh, also they do give you a strain release here, which does release a bit of strain. I think it could be a bit more flexible in general, but at least the integrated one. And when you come to the plug itself, which I do like this type of thing, so you can just handle it well. Uh, some uh, dongles that I have are pretty difficult to get in and out of with the 3.5 millimeter jack. So having a bit of, bit of texturing here is definitely well appreciated by me. And uh, especially after trying the Olina, which is so slippery, like I cannot really unplug it in one of my dongles. It's really just, it isn't a great experience. This one, however, is like aluminum. Yeah, just feels well made, feels very integrated, is uh, nice to handle. And then we go up, matching the silver style, you also get this nicely textured splitter. And looking on top here, then we basically get two cables that are, I think, yeah, they are thinner than the bottom cable here, but they still follow the same style. And let me remove the ear hook, come on ear hook, be a good boy. Also, if you see it here, this is also relatively smooth again. Also, they follow the, yeah, the good trend of this cable being smooth, but still sturdy enough. And then we come to the splitter, also follows the same style. And I think this is my, might be my biggest complaint with this cable. The splitter is just very difficult to move. I, I always want to be pretty careful with it because I'm afraid it might damage the cable. Like it's really difficult to move. Like yeah, I really have to apply force in order to move it. So I would have liked to see a bit the higher tolerances here. I mean, definitely stays in place. No questions asked. Like other splitters just move down after half a second. This one definitely stays in place. But it's just a bit too rigid. It, like, it tolerance is a bit too tight. And yeah, then the top of the cable, as I said, it's a bit thinner, but still follows the same style. Still feels, however, like sturdy made. I have no worries about this cable not lasting. And when we come to the ear hooks, which as you can see are also transparently rubberized, and they have a not too thick rubberized coating. You can see like the way it springs is not too fast or not too much, but still you can see the angle it uh, rotates around. If you have big ears, I think especially this band here could be a bit too much for you in terms of comfort. So I would have recommended them going a bit least less rubberized the top here, or maybe go for a bit b bigger of an angle, but it should be fine because the connector here is at least like four millimeters high. 
And it also, uh, if you talk about an attention to detail, mm -hmm, the L and R markings here on the connector, <laughs> unfortunately, are not well visible. I would have liked to see a uh, black marking or something that makes it easier to spot which is L and R, because just assuming you put this on another IEM, because the cable feels nice in the hand, it will be pretty difficult to just find L and R just uh, because it's not really visible. Like you can just see if I put it around, very hard to see. And yeah, this is even good lighting. Just imagine if lighting would be a bit worse, you won't see anything with this. But yes, generally, I really like this cable. It feels well made. It is very sturdy while not being too uh, too robust and too yeah uh, uh, wavy at the same time. It just isn't really a good cable. And yeah, definitely, Janin, this is a good job here. Better than the IEM build, in my opinion. And then let's come to comfort. So as I said, this radius, and we talk about comfort, could be a bit too small for you here. So if you know you have big ears, this could be an issue for you. But for me, it just wasn't. I could just flop the cable over my ears and it totally fit me well. But what is a big issue in terms of comfort? And I will not like uh, uh, like go around the bush or whatever you were, uh, what, what would be saying in English here. The pressure hole here just doesn't work. This IEM has, I think, a 10 millimeter biocellulose driver and it has driver flex. And really not of the good kind, but you just say it's bit, like you just put it in and it just will repressurize after some time. It does not matter which kind of silicon tips. Uh, these are my regular uh, choose between silicon tips I flopped on just didn't work. I could not use any D silicon tips on the canon. Like all of them had driver flex and all of them were pretty bad. And even worse, uh, also the driver flex at this one here, because it creates a really strong vacuum, it also deteriorates the sound for me. Really not good and really does really only possible, possible tip I could use is here cut foam tips. That's the only thing I could use with the Canon. Otherwise, I just couldn't wear it for any amounts of time because I just don't like the feeling of vacuum in my ear. And I don't think there are many people liking it. So really, if you don't like driver flex, this IEM is already dead right from the start because it has some pretty bad driver flex and it cannot be fixed if you don't like to use foam tips. But assuming you are okay with the driver flex or you are okay with foam tips, I think the Canon can be pretty comfortable. Because the nice thing that the Canon has, it has a relatively small footprint of a shell. Let me just get the H14 comparison. You can see this one has noticeable less curve. It's like noticeable smaller in all dimensions, while still following the semi-custom shape. So that then leads to an IEM that will fit even smaller ears pretty well, unlike the H40, where I would say now might be a bit too big for small ears. Also, nice about this IEM. The nozzle is not that long. Yeah, combined with the additional like uh, uh, insertion depth by the IEM itself, it's still like medium wide insertion, but not too long. So yeah, this is basically four millimeter in length. I did measure it. And yeah, the uh, tip, uh, the lip is slightly uh, recessed to the back, which in my opinion works pretty good for comfort because that means you have less uh, like mm, thickness directly at the uh, like at the end of the nozzle where it usually is more uncomfortable. This one just makes it a bit more comfortable for my ear candle at least, which is relatively small. So again, I usually need to take S as tips because S just is too big. And yeah, also in general, the uh, terms of thickness of the nozzle, it just is not as thick. It's about five millimeters. And yeah, uh, this one adds, I think like 0 0.5 millimeters more, but it's really like, this is a very, well chosen nozzle size and also I think the angle of insertion, which again, I will be throwing on in graph so you can see in a graph, but in picture where you can see the measurements better and the angle. I think it has all been chosen relatively well and that combined with the uh, like smallish footprint of this one, it can make the Canon fit your ears pretty damn well. Of course, again, assuming you don't like, you don't dislike the driver flex or you are fine with foam tips. Then if you are fine with all of those things, like I think it can be worn all day, like really the foam tips, I just flopped it in my ear, foop in, and then I forgot about it. It was really comfortable and I can recommend it in, at least if you are, as I said, fine with driver flex or foam tips. And that brings me to the next chapter, which I can make relatively short, isolation. The Canon is specified with minus 26 decibels, or like 26 decibels of passive isolation, which is 
decent for IEMs, but not great. And yeah, for, especially for Zemi custom shells, it's not that great. And unfortunately, as I said, it feels a bit like light and a bit thin. And that also means in real life, it's not isolating that good. Putting on silicone tips, again, you have driver flex, but forget about that for a moment. You really don't have a good isolation. I would definitely call it a good bit below average in terms of passive isolation. Putting foam tips on gets you still like better, but even then I would still prefer other IEMs. Like the H40 without any question isolates a good bit better than this one. Like, so really in terms of isolation, you're definitely below average, even if it's optimal configuration. So yeah, it's probably okay for your office or at home, but I would not recommend it for city center, tram, train. I, I <laughs> not really, just not that well isolating. And that then brings me to our next chapter, drivability. Clocking in at only eight ohms with a whopping 128 decibels of sensitivity, this IEM on paper is very efficient. And in real life, yeah, it also is very efficient. So putting it on your smartphone, it gets very loud, very, very loud. And also if you put it on your random ass dongle, I don't think you get much more if you up to better quality. Of course, when with this low of an uh, uh, resistance uh, or like an ohmage, right? You definitely will hear if you are uh, uh, dongles or if your smartphone have a noise floor. And you can, can confirm I have a cheap dongle here. I definitely do hear a noise floor with this dongle with the Canon, which I haven't heard with other IEMs. So keep that in mind. But generally, you don't need power to get this driven. Like the biocellulose dynamic in here, it just keeps going basically at no power. And it, uh, um, uh, yeah, I don't want to spoil uh, how well they are matched together, so we'll talk about it later on. So yes, you get like 90% of what the Canon is capable on even the cheapest dongle, I think. Again, minus the noise floor, you need to look out for that. And just upping the power just a bit to something like the BTR5 or the Shanling UA2, which uh, I'm currently using. This gives you basically everything. If you up the power even more to, for my desktop setup with the SP200 and the SU8 as DAC, I didn't notice any improvement here. And also, in my opinion, you don't really need additional brightness with the uh, Canon or additional bass. So <laughs> I even tried my um, my uh, hybrid uh, tube setup, and unfortunately, the noise floor of that is just unbearable. I couldn't use it, but just assuming you up the volume so you don't notice the noise floor too much, even then, I don't think you need additional warmth of this one uh, or brightness by the VTR5. Nothing of that is needed. It doesn't make it didn't make it worse, but it also didn't improve. And that brings me then to sound. And uh, yeah, I start being off with the general sound characteristics. And for this, we have to come back to the dip switches. Whoop, let's dip them around. So yes, um, this comes with three dip switches that definitely do change quite a bit of the sound. And I will be throwing on graphs of all configurations so you can see if some of those configurations are good for you. But generally, this is always in V-shaped IEM. It doesn't matter what you do with these switches, it's always V-shaped and it can be brought from a very warm V-shape to a V-shape to a just slightly V-shaped or maybe even a bit U-shaped depending on like how you set up the switches. Um, yeah, generally my preferred configuration after listening to this for like um, two months or so is definitely this one. So only the middle switch on, both other switches off. This gives you the best balanced configuration while not sacrificing extension. Because definitely this one extends better than other IEMs that I have heard. And it has a pretty decent treble. But yeah, with some configurations it does not manage as much as it does. So in my opinion, uh, like I noticed, uh, I wrote them down as 0, 1, 0 is the best configuration. All others are not as balanced. Another configuration I would recommend is uh, 011 or 001. But then again, I think those can be a bit too reshaped for some. So yeah, just the most balanced one is 010 and all of us are just, yeah, like I was fine with the others I said. And uh, with small note, uh, in terms of treble, I liked most uh, 010, but that is so reshaped. I just, the vocals just get totally pushed back and I, I just like my vocals, so yeah, just wasn't for me. 
But uh, if you like yourself and really reshaped IEM with a like, huge base shelf, this can be something for you. And yeah, just keep in mind you have switches so you can experiment with them. And maybe if you want one IEM for many courses, this can work for you because it's definitely pretty flexible. And it brings me directly to the sound details. And as usual, I'll be starting off with treble. Yes, the Canon, according to the graph, extends to like 13K before dipping and just with most configurations. Um, yeah, I can tell you because IEC, couple, IEC 711 coupler is not that accurate after 10K. It definitely reaches past 10K, but I can't tell you how far. It could be that it's 13, it could be that it's 15. I'm not entirely sure my ear, while still being able to hear it, is just not enough trained to tell you like how far it reaches. But it does reach past 10K and it gives it a pretty good amount of air on top, which, yeah, does not, I think, so not sound the most natural to my ear, but it definitely sounds pretty detailed, uh, at least in the upper treble department. So comparing it again to my variations, yeah, this is definitely variations hits more of the upper treble neutral target, but this one definitely extends better and gives you a better feeling of air wear. And this can be a good thing. For instance, I noted in um, Ovana, this is basically a fusion jazz slash rock. Um, I noted here rock is too heavy as track or Japanese bonus track or waves. Yeah, definitely. I liked the leading edge here. It was very well defined in the upper treble, uh, just not as, <laughs> as variations. Um, it did come off as a bit unnatural, a bit too much pronounced. But yeah, like for BA, I want to say this is a good implementation of upper treble. And uh, even I want to say that too much pronounced one, but I did like it. And uh, if you are a fan of that, just as me who generally likes more treble, I think you are pretty much fine with the upper treble presentation with most configurations. You can reduce the upper treble with some of these switches, but for me, I just like it. So I kept the uh, yeah, additional upper treble energy on there. So yeah, uh, then depending uh, like on mid treble, mid treble basically here, depending on your configuration, it's a similar story. You can get more energy than what would be strictly speaking neutral, but you don't have to. Uh, putting on the right switches will reduce it a bit and give you a more relaxed representation. So again, my preferred configuration here was 0, 1, 0, which gives you a plateau between like 8-ish to 11-ish K there. Um, and if you don't like an uh, like 8-ish K peak, like this might not be for you. But uh, generally with this configuration, I felt like you don't really get an 8K peak. It's definitely more pushed towards 9-ish K. So uh, you it can be a bit sibilant, let's not uh, hide that. Uh, with some of the tracks with vocalists, it can be a bit sibilant, but it really was not as bad as other IEMs that I have heard that had similar peaks. And yeah, followed by that, then you have uh, uh, like an, like, I don't want to say like a roller coaster, but yeah, you have a dip at like 5.5K, followed by a small peak at like 6.5K, and then again a dip at like 7.5K. And yeah, this generally, I want to say, is not the most natural representation again but I did not find it to be distracting and I did not think it skewed too much the tonality between fundamentals and harmonics. So yeah, e-guitars generally had enough bite, pianos had a good clarity without coming off as too harsh and especially um, yeah, in uh, uh, Neo Automata soundtrack, which I noted here, I did pretty much like the mid treble representation while having also a bit more upper treble energy. Um, also, uh, also most uh, Katsutoshi Morizono, let's get fusion jazz, I also did like most of their stuff with the Canon. It's not the most natural representation again, but definitely my cup of tea. And then we come to lower travel and upper mids. And yeah, they are decently defined. They are not as well defined as for instance with the variations. But again, variations could be a bit hot in the lower travel, upper mid department for some. So I think this is an, strikes a good balance there. Um, however, having said that, in some vocal tracks, uh, uh, female vocal tracks, for instance, uh, never fade away from the Cyberpunk 2077 soundtrack, it, the vocals are already a bit pushed back in the mix. With this one, they just 
didn't come off as as well represented as I'd like them. So they're just a bit lost in the mix. And same can happen if you have uh, um, specific piano notes that happen in this area that are, can be a bit overshadowed by the again upper treble piano notes. But it's really not too bad. Like the, again, as I said before, the uh, uh, fundamentals, harmonics, also generally the different tones you can reach there. Like it's still balanced well enough. I didn't have much complaint there. Um, in the near automata soundtrack, when we can come back to uh, lower treble and upper mids, I did really like that one. It had a good clarity, it had a good energy, it didn't feel like I was missing anything and I really liked the uh, yeah, overall uh, amount and uh, tonality it had here. It never was hot in any way, it was always natural, so I did like it with the near automata soundtrack. Which brings me to mids. And yeah, again, I skip upper mids because I have had them with lower treble together. So I directly jump to the mid mids, main mids, yeah, and they are not, they are certainly not bad, but they still take a bit of a backseat compared to the bass and the treble. It's really, it's yeah, even with the uh, zero one zero configuration, which is the most balanced one, where you have a decent amount of mid bass and uh, like a good balance between mid bass and treble without having like the mids too put par far pushed back. It's enough for my library, but I still don't think it's that great. So I noted here again, I'm a Linkin Park fan and I'm gladly admit that the vocals of Chester, for instance, in In The End or Crawling or everything else, they were not as intense and not as yeah well also staged as I want them to be. So it wasn't bad, certainly, but really not that great. However, um, other vocalists, like uh, from Warrior Path, I did notice Black Knight or Valhalla Rising had a bit of a similar balance issues, but it wasn't as much pronounced as it was in In The End or Crawling. If you change the genre, for instance, to like Synthwave or Synth Pop, here I noticed uh, Kavinsky's latest album, Reborn. Again, the uh, song Reborn and uh, Renegade also. They're usually mixed to be working with reshaped devices because that's the most common IEM or most common headphone you have. But even then, I did find the mids not to be in strong point with any configuration. Even again in the best one, zero, zero, one, zero, it's still not as good. And if you <laughs> up the base of a treble to like a zero, one, uh, zero, one, one and uh, uh, oh. Zero, zero, 001 or voila, my favorite one for travel minus the bass then uh, 101 zero, one. just not great and really the vocals are pushed much too far in the background so if you don't mind you having like lost vocals i think this can be working in terms of mids but really it's not a strong point in any way shape and that then brings me to the lower mids. And yeah, if you like both, the uh, Canon definitely delivers in the lower mids, where it definitely has a decent amount of additional warmth and then like slow gain until all of the sub bass. So that means if you have lower pitched male vocals, they have more energy than the uh, like mid mids basically there. And also bass guitars uh, definitely do come off as pretty well. I did notice here again after the rain from the album 4.74. 4.17 p.m. Um, yeah, I did like the warmth and the smooth the mid to uh, lower mid to upper mid bass glide has. Like definitely didn't come off as too muddy, even for the graph might indicate it. So I think that could be a good like a, a good crossover there or maybe the, uh, the dynamic we're using is just relatively good in this region, but it didn't come off as muddy or anything. So yeah. And yeah, then that brings me to the bass region. And yeah, uh, I think again, like you have a glide in the upper mid bass there, so it's not that much pronounced. Um, and if you go to mid bass, basically, yeah, like depending on your configuration, you maybe don't get like a well pronounced mid bass. So you definitely, most configurations, you will definitely lose a punch. Like it does not punch at all. But if you go for my favorite configuration, you do get a bit more mid bass to sub bass, which makes you definitely have get a better, better pun feeling of punch at this one. But for the description, Beut Celose, which for some might indicate it's really punchy and really well, not like tech, yeah, textured, probably also di dynamic, this one just didn't come off as that well. For instance, the Night Owl that I do own and that loses in Biocellose, I had the feeling it was much better textured and it also had a better punch, even for it doesn't really have mid-bass at all. So yeah, it has an, 
it, it's it's not horrible to say so. Like really, this is not like a really flat base IEM. So you still get a bit of punch in the base, but for Biocellose, I am also a bit disappointed by how much it can. Uh, also, my DIY headphone, which I hope I can manage in video like in a few weeks. Uh, also, that one has much more punch in the mid base there, and also has Biocellose driver. So yeah, I'm not sure if this is just the way it is tuned that when makes the mid base to be a bit not that great, or if it is just that uh, Biocellose does not work as well in small factors. I'm not entirely sure. But really, I was not a fan of the way mid bass was represented here because it didn't have as much texture as I first also expected it to have. And speed as well also wasn't too great. But generally, the tonality was not too bad. So again, this is a bit of a punch. But tonality, I didn't mind. So again, uh, the Brigador soundtrack comes to my mind here. Uh, this was definitely sounding pretty pleasant and I did not have any like issues with the terms of how uh, mid bass to sub bass is sounding. It just was good but not awesome. And note weight wise also was there, but yeah, like I've heard IMs that had better note weight. The only configuration that gives you a decent mid bass punch, in my opinion, is a 001. That gives you definitely more punch, but it also comes then at the cost of, uh, I want to say, a bit of treble energy here. And uh, yeah, I don't think this might be for everyone, but this definitely gives you the best kicks with drums, in my opinion. And however, this comes when it is in the cost of a, a, yeah, more uh, energy in the upper bass, and that then means, yeah, it definitely does then no sound as clean as other configurations. And then let's come to sub bass, and according to Graph, it extends all the way and glide to the sub bass, easily reaching 20 hertz, probably if you just see the graph, even 10 hertz. So with most soundtracks, um, yeah, the tonality in terms of sub bass, especially with uh, movie soundtracks like Interstellar or Blade Runner, uh, just worked very well here. I did like the tonality very much. And uh, yeah, my usual reference soundtrack, which is Mountains from the Interstellar soundtrack, uh, just use it because it has texture with a very low sub bass note. And this usually reveals like how far like textured IEMs can represent sub bass. And while I like the tonality, I don't think the texture of the sub bass here is really well defined. So that means I, it does reach like two minutes 14, maybe two minutes 14, five with a decent but not awesome texture. And after that, it's basically gone. Like there isn't much to speak of after that. I don't even get that feeling of rumble, which is a bit disappointing if you see the graph. And again, interestingly, um, the best IEM that I have heard in this track is the LZA7 that managed two minutes 16. Uh, with texture until like two minutes 15 five and then you still get rumble like still feeling of energy This one does not manage. So I really think the uh, Dynamic we are using here is really not a strong point in mid to sub bass. I think it's the Strong point is maybe that in like uh, upper bass and lower uh, Mid region it does not come off as muddy even for it has additional energy there But just I don't think the dynamic is that well for uh, at this price point at least. It's not bad, but it just isn't as good as I expected. Especially again because speed was not a strong point here. And uh, yeah, coming from the S12, which I have listened to over last week, oh boy, S12 so much better in terms of uh, base quality. Not quantity, but quality that it's kind of hard to go back to the Canon again and just listen to and like build Celoso driver that's supposed to be pretty good, but just does not manage the speed and the texture and the note weight, but for instance, the S12 does. And S12 is so much cheaper, but I'm not entirely sure why, like this is like, according to graph should be pretty good base, but it just isn't. And I think if you like the tonality, like me, you are fine, but if you just listen to details, I don't know, just is not worth the price in terms of bass for me. But if we come to soundstage, layering and imaging, I would describe the Canon definitely does deliver more there. It does have a pretty good stage, giving every instrument its own space, uh, like it own, it, its own space in the room. And they're also uh, well separated, definitely being a step up from the H40, which has a pretty big soundstage, but struggles sometimes a bit to just give them an individual space. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely an upgrade, um, but 
again, the general sizing uh, in all dimensions, I think H40 is a bit better than the Canon. But it's definitely no slouch to speak of. So you can absolutely live with it. And especially because it has better separation and better uh, uh, imaging, definitely this can be good for you. But I just didn't find it to be awesome. Again, I found S12 had also a bigger stage for less money. And uh, yeah, just it's it's good stage, but not great. <laughs> And yeah, when we talk about layering, I think this is also pretty well done here. Like you do usually get like four, uh, sorry, five layers. So it means you get the center layer, you get a bit more out, and then you get like on the height of the ear one layers. I'd say layering can be even good if some of the tracks uh, I have definitely do manage sometimes a seventh outside layer here. I noticed here Macabre Serenade from Nightcrawler. That was definitely, again, imaging here is pretty good. So I could pinpoint where some of the, I could definitely pinpoint where some of the grasshoppers in this track in the back are. I could tell you where the, uh, the, where the base is happening. It just was like well imaged in the stage it had. <laughs> but again, I don't think it was awesomely imaged. So for the price being, I'm not sure if I would describe it as good. I think it just tangent, tangents, tangents, it tangents a good adjective but not doesn't reach exactly that for $350 or 420 euros. I just want a bit more. So I think if you're not too critical, yeah, well, so you can give it the good. We, we can say it's good, but not great. And that brings me to separation, dynamics and coherence. And I starting off with the good things because coherence, oh boy, like including the timber, the timber, this one is definitely one of those uh, IEMs where I want to say they really nailed the matching of the dynamic to the uh, BAs. Like really, one of the few cases where I am not really able to tell you where the crossover point between dynamic and BA is. Like I just can't. It's, it, it's from, to my ear at least, it's impossible. And that also means that you do have, even at low volumes, you can't distinguish the sound. Like the, it's so organic with Humber here. I really like the way like the general coherence and Humber was done with this one. Again, like, the treble can come off as like sounding a bit like artificial at times, but generally I did not have any problem with the Humber here. Like I would not describe it as like plasticky or wooden. I didn't have that, like maybe tad plasticky, but really just very well done here and uh, yeah this definitely outperforms for instance my age 40 which i also did say and uh, definitely coherence between the different drivers is also far better than on variations like really low volume variations like you do get really three very distinct driver types here and just does not have it it just sounds so organic over the whole spectrum just very well done and also when we talk about um, the separation yeah, I think it does separate pretty well. It gives vocals and different uh, piano notes and guitars very clear lines being separated from everything else. Uh, I just think the biggest problem here is its price point again. In After importing like more than 400 brings it in the direction of variations. And I'm sorry, variations is just a step up in terms of separation here, like a noticeable step up. With variations, I can separate individual piano notes, like here and here and here and here. And this will just not manage it. It's it's good, you can distinguish it well enough, but just variations isn't step up from there. But again, I want uh, I would say like it's it's really good, right? It's it's not the niveau of the variations, but still good. So um, I noted here a uh, plastic echelon from Yun Fukamashi again this nicely demonstrated that the uh, the Canon is capable of separating pianos and guitars and just separating this like relatively like busy fusion jazz well in the room and so yeah this probably also leads back to its imaging capabilities so yeah generally this worked well <laughs> I just don't think it's again price appropriate after importing I think for $350 if you get the variations at like 450 I think then might be price appropriate. But again, I got the variations for 450 euros while the uh, uh, Canon I got for 420, I think, euros. So that makes me a bit hesitant to recommend it. Again, price performance ratio here, right? So if you really get it, let's say for 350 here Canon versus 450 variations, I think then you can call the uh, separation here uh, very good, 
But if you get it as European, then it will basically be like this scoot, so like just a tiny bit more expensive variations. Then I would say it's a bit harder sell for me. Uh, yeah. But it's over good things, right? Uh, so still, I wonder if the separation was well done and I didn't have any problems with the price. Even at 400, like 20, I would say it's still like goodish. A variation is just great, so I would say still good here. But what did I skip so far? Dynamics. And I'm, I'm really sorry to say this, but the Canon really is not a dynamic IEM. It really struggles, in my opinion, to give you a really nice feeling of macro dynamics. And macro dynamics for that instance as well. So again, when I listen to Fusion Jazz and I put on Plastic Echelon or another one, a Japanese bonus track for Movane or something else, it just struggles to give you the dynamics I'm used to. So I did notice as a first adjective that came to my mind after listening to it for a few days, it makes everything sound uniform. So it gives you a really good amount of macro details here. Like it just, it, it comes off as very detailed on the first listening. Like really you think like, oh boy, this is detailed. I've never heard before. What's going on? What, what is here? And then you listen to it and then you notice if you do a one-to-one -one comparison, Yes, it manages that, but it does that at the cost of dynamics. So it pushes out quite passages much too high in terms of volume and makes them just come off as like no dynamic or like very little dynamic. And I get why some people say this is then for them very good or end game because yeah, you do get a very well or a very good feeling of detail. Like we putting this on in one to one comparison to variations just gave me at the first glance at least, a feeling of, wow, this is very well detailed. Like maybe also, and then the travel extension adds to that. But if you then listen more in detail to it, you just notice the dynamics, nay far the macro, no, the micro dynamics are good. So if you have some, if you have two like quiet notes, basically both of them are the same volume and they are both too loud. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> this just lags for me here. So the only thing that I can tell you, like if you have a really loud note and a really quiet note, you will be able to distinguish them. But again, if it's just medium quiet, then it will be pushed up a bit and it will definitely sound as too much for me. So yeah, sorry to tell you like dynamics on this one, just not good. And yeah, I think that can also lead me already to the verdict. Um, yeah, it was a very long review. I know I already see the time here on my uh, recording device, but I have to say it is in front IEM, it has a great cable, it has a good comfort if you get around the driver flex, which unfortunately has. And uh, also its general technicalities are fine to go at its price. But I just see it struggling at the imported price. Like if you put on the tax and the import fees for Europe here, as I said, like we had more than 400 and that then brings it pretty close to variations. and. Adding to this is again like not having good dynamics, which is for me at least, who really listens to fusion jazz relatively often, it's key to my music. And I'm just not liking this like pushed up macro details and then the missing dynamics in that. But if you are fine with that, I think you can have still a good experience with the Canon. And yeah, I, unfortunately I can just not recommend it as it is. Like it's a bit too expensive for what I hear. And also the biocellulose dynamic, as some people claimed, I just don't hear it being competitive. Like really other biocellulose things I've heard were just better than this one. So yeah, I want to say it's still a goodish IEM and I don't hear much wrong with it if you get the right configuration for you, but I just, I, it's just not good enough for me. And I think, yeah, that's uh, about it. So uh, yeah. If you have any questions, if you have uh, uh, criti criticisms, if you have uh, uh, IEMs you can recommend me or anything else, please leave a comment. And with this, Dawn Spector out.